Hello and welcome to the sixth talk on critical perspectives on technology. Um, as some of you know, but not everyone, <laughs> is that I organized this lecture series as part of my project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design, which is funded by the Austrian Science Fund. Uh, my name is Katja Spiel and I'm a Hertha Fernberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. But today you are here to hear from Bo. Bo Ruberg, a PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies and an affiliate faculty member in the Department of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. Their research explores gender and sexuality in digital media and digital cultures with a focus on queerness and video games. They are the author of the Queer Games Avant-Garde, how LGBTQ game makers are reimagining the medium of video games, which has been published just last year at Duke University Press and is also the co-editor of Queer Game Studies, which has been published 2017 at the University of Minnesota Press and also wrote the book, Video Games Have Always Been Queer, in which was published in 2019 by the New York University Press. Ruberg is also the co-founder and co-organizer of the annual Queerness and Games Conference, and they received their PhD in Comparative Literature with certification in New Media and Gender and Sexuality Studies from the University of California, Berkeley and served as a provost postdoctoral fellow in the interactive media and games division at the University of Southern California. Uh, their presentation is titled, um, similar to the book, uh, The Queer Games Avant-Garde. Um, you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or however Bo tells you to. Um, and afterwards, we will all be in discussion led by Johanna Pirke, who is a computer scientist focusing on game development, research, and education, and an active and strong voice of the local indie dev community. Local means Austria. So <laughs> she has a lengthy experience in designing, developing, and evaluating games and VR experiences, and believes in them as tools to support learning, collaboration, and solving real problems. At the moment, she is an assistant professor for game development at the Technical University of Graz and researches games with a focus on artificial intelligence, human computer interaction, data analysis, and virtual reality technologies. But for now, Bo, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, Kata, for that introduction. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to get to talk with you all. Um, Johanna, I'm looking forward to getting to talk with you too and learning about the local, which means Austrian indie scene. So I'm excited about that. Um, so I'm Bo Ruberg. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm thinking in terms of questions, maybe it's good because it's hard for me to see slides and chat at the same time. So maybe good to put questions in chat and then we'll come back to them after the presentation, which is probably about half an hour or so. Does that seem okay? Okay, great. So let me um, jump you into some slides. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes, okay, great. Um, so as Gato was saying, I'm gonna um, be talking to you today about this newest project that I was working on, um, which is called The Queer Games Avant-Garde, how LGBTQ game makers are reimagining the medium of video games. Um, I am in the film and media studies department at UC Irvine, but until I guess this time last year, time has been very strange. I was in the informatics department so I'm excited to get to talk with folks and I'll have a little bit at the end of the presentation thinking about how some of the work I'm talking about coming from art spaces and humanity spaces can be translated over to design um, and how there might be dialogues with HCI. Um, you're very welcome to reach out. I'll show you the slide at the end as well um, over email, over Twitter. I'd be excited to talk to you. So um, this is me, I work at UC Irvine, um, and I just wanted to say before jumping in that a lot of this work I do is highly collaborative. So you can see here on the right, this is our lab. I run a lab of um, PhD students with Aaron Trammell, uh, which is a really great group of folks who also work on games, cultural issues, diversity, social justice. Um, so a lot of the things I'm gonna tell you about have many people involved as well. Uh, I find it helpful to know a little bit about my background because I'm interdisciplinary in this way that I tend to think of as a kind of like fruit salad hodgepodge of backgrounds. I mean, I think you'll hear little bits of all of this. 
Um, so my PhD is in, in the humanities and comparative literature, um, but I worked in the uh, Center for New Media at Berkeley. I did a postdoc in um, the what's called the Interactive Media and Games Division at USC, but that's really the game design department. Um, so working with students who were actively designing games. Um, I'm often in dialogue with industry. So I've been going to the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco for a long time now, for 15 years or something like that. Um, so often thinking about how to translate this work to industry. Um, and then for me, all of that is kind of wrapped up in this question of um, intersectionality, social justice, um, and looking for ways to take tech, take games, and make it more equitable and more just. So these are some of the books that Katu was just mentioning. Um, and I bring them up here because they kind of represent what for me are sort of different approaches to the work that I do. So um, I wrote this monograph, Video Games Have Always Been Queer, which is about taking queer theory and applying it to games. So it's really that humanistic theoretical perspective where you say, you know, queerness um, can be a theoretical lens. What happens if we bring it to video games? How can we see them differently? This queer game studies collection, which I co-edited with Adrienne Shaw, um, is much more community-based. So it's 25 different essays that come from scholars, but also game makers. And it's about how do you build a field around thinking about queerness in games. But this most recent project that I'm gonna focus on here is really about the artistic practice and the political practice of making games themselves. Um, so it's not a traditional monograph. It you know, has a kind of introduction, but the majority of it is interviews with folks who come from what I call the queer games avant-garde, um, which is this really vibrant network of queer and trans folks making video games. So the goal is to kind of foreground the voices of folks who are on the, the forefront of designing this work that I'll tell you more about in a sec, um, as opposed to a kind of traditional academic analysis that can be a little bit more removed. So here's the plan of what I'm gonna tell you about. Um, I'm gonna give you kind of a crash course intro to queerness and games. Um, it's actually a pretty wide and rich area. Um, then I'll tell you more specifically about this network that I call the Queer Games Avant-Garde. Um, and then I wanna draw out across the interviews, across the profiles that appear in the book, some of the themes and threads, but also some of the tensions and the differences. So I think that's one of the most interesting things to see here is both where folks doing similar work have things in common, but then also where there are points of pushback and difference from within those communities. Um, and then going forward, the hope is to find new ways of thinking that are about games, um, about tech and about design more broadly. <clears throat> so kind of a quick introduction to queerness and games. Um, like I was saying, it's actually a pretty broad area. I find that when I tell people about this work, they're often surprised that you can work on queerness and video games together because they think of video games as a kind of toxic space, uh, an exclusionary space. And in a lot of ways that's true, but you'll see that there are actually a lot of things happening at that intersection between queerness and games. So just to kind of define these terms, right? Queer and games. I know some of you in, in this room are super familiar with one of these things or the other of these things or both of them already. Um, but I find it helpful to go through these terms. Doing an inter interdisciplinary work is interesting, right? Because sometimes people are not speaking the same language to start with. So that's why I do it. Um, so of course, queer has kind of two main meanings that I'm working with here. And in my work, I try and kind of go back and forth between them. So the first one is as an umbrella term this term that can mean kind of anyone who falls into the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. Um, so it's a kind of identity term, but then it's also been a kind of reclaimed term, right? So it has um, a sort of political charge to it, the idea that you are proud to be queer. And um, this is the bumper sticker that's on the back of my car. You can't quite see it there, it's a little cut off, but it says, oh dear, I'm queer. Um, and it makes me really happy. <laughs> So we've got that identity version, but then the other meaning of queer that we can work with is more conceptual, more broad. So we can think about queerness as a, a force or a way of being that resists or rejects norms of sexuality and gender. Um, and definitely some folks in queer theory go farther than that and they think about queerness as um, generally kind of overturning the status quo or questioning what, what is a norm. Um, but across that spectrum, I think it's important to remember that this work is political. 
So even when um, something is conceptual, even when it's theoretical, it still has the politics of trying to kind of upend the hegemonic social order. So on the other side, video games, um, what am I talking about when I talk about games? Um, there's still tons of folks out there in the world who kind of see this when they think about games. Um, <clears throat> so they think about you know, things like Grand Theft Auto, first person shooters, they have this vision of violence. Um, or on the other side, they think about kids, they think about education. Um, all of those things are true, right? But when I'm talking about games, I'm talking about a much wider world of what counts as video games. Um, so of course, there are tons of other kinds of games, things like um, you know, puzzle games, narrative games, things that are silly. I tend to, the games I love best are things that are colorful and a little bit strange. Um, these are just some of my favorites from the last few years, like Donut County and Untitled Goose Game. So for me, when I'm using this broad term, all of these things fall within it. So at this intersection of queerness and games, what are some of the things that we might see here? One of the things that gets talked about the most is um, what we might think of as LGBT representation in mainstream games. So what's called AAA games, these really big blockbuster games. Um, and we are starting to see more and more of that. So we have characters in games like Overwatch or in the Assassin's Creed series, um, the Mass Effect games, Dragon Age games. And we are kind of getting an increased amount of diversity there in mainstream games. But there's also a ton of stuff to talk about that's not from the mainstream, that's not from the big corporate game side. Um, for example, thinking about queer games communities. Um, so like Katya mentioned, I am one of the co-founders of uh, the Queerness and Games Conference, which I, of course, I think it's great because I helped make it, but is a really special space in that it is entirely dedicated to uh, queer issues in game design, also in game scholarship. Uh, it runs approximately once a year and it's about 300 queer people all in a building for a weekend. Um, and what's been really great about it is that uh, it explicitly crosses over between academia and industry. So the hope there is to build dialogues that are not just academic, not just design-based, but to think about how we can find collaboration between them. There's also a ton of uh, queer presence in games history. So we tend to think of queerness as having come to games only recently um, but for example, there was an entire exhibit in Germany a few years ago called the Rainbow Arcade that was just about queer games history organized by Adrienne Shaw and some of her collaborators. And um, we have the fan side where fans are bringing queerness to games just all over the place. So we find in fan art and fan fiction and cosplay ways that fans are turning video games into something queer. There's also this piece of it that is kind of near and dear to my heart, which is the idea that you can kind of take video games that might not seem to have any LGBT representation in them and understand them queerly. And um, so this is one of my very favorite games. This is Octodad, uh, which is about being a floppy yellow octopus um, in a business suit. And you have to try and pass as a kind of normal, quote unquote, white suburban dad. Um, so it's a game that seems just really kind of silly and fun. It's a physics game, so it's kind of hard to control and absurd. But once you think about the narrative, you can really quickly begin to see the way that it parallels experiences for queer folks and trans folks and folks with disabilities of passing in a normative society. So there's all of that that we might talk about when we talk about queerness in games. And, but there's also this piece that is, I think, really at the forefront of all of this, which is queer and trans folks who are actually making their own indie games. Um, so this tends to be a lot of work that comes from more broadly the indie space, so places like IndieCade, but even kind of at the fringes of that uh, really experimental, scrappy work. And um, that's, you know, it, it's an interesting thing to think about how it's both kind of marginal and also, as I'll, I'll talk about in a second, kind of leading. Um, leading the experiments in design that are kind of revolutionizing games themselves. So when I talk about this queer games avant-garde, there we go. What I'm talking about is a kind of extended network of queer and trans game developers who are 
as you'll see, at the forefront of contemporary video game design. Um, so when I say network, it's not necessarily just one community, not folks in just one place. Um, there are a lot of folks in North America, but also extended across Europe um, and increasingly other parts of the world as well. Um, and they're making video games, but also analog games. So we're seeing a crossover between the digital and the non-digital. And what kind of unifies their work is this idea that it challenges us to reimagine what video games can be. Um, so often this work will uh, play off of traditional video game tropes. Sometimes it won't look like a traditional video game at all. Uh, so it really kind of forces us to rethink what games can be. In terms of its politics, this is really important. So queer games avant-garde work makes games that are designed by, for, and about queer and trans people. So it's not work that's being done um, you know, about diverse populations by straight or cis folks. Um, it's work that's made by queer and trans people that is often, not always, but often intended for other queer and trans people to play and to find connections. Uh, so in that way, queerness isn't just about the content of these games, and often their content does not look like traditional LGBT representation. And um, it's also in the ethos of how these games are made and who they're made for. So a little bit of history. We can think about the kind of origin of the queer games avant-garde. The first moment where it really starts coalescing as about 2012. Uh, we have in that year the publication of Anna Anthropy's book, Rise of the Video Game Zinesters, which as I did these interviews with queer game makers uh, was really influential for a lot of folks. Uh, we have a kind of first core group of queer game makers who were living in Oakland in the East Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and we see kind of early influential works come up from that. So Anna Anthropy's Dysphoria, Maddie Bryce's Minichi, um, work by Liz Ryerson, things like that. But since then, in the intervening years, this has really exploded. So we're not just talking about a few creators anymore. We are talking about, you know, it's hard to get a, a clear count, but at some point I'd say dozens, then I started saying hundreds. I think we're probably in the hundreds, maybe we're in the thousands. Um, just tons and tons of folks who are making indie games about queer and trans issues. Uh, so this is from itch.io, for example, a little while ago now, the numbers have grown up, gone up, but you can see there are already more than 1,200 games here tagged just with LGBT. And even that LGBT tag does not encompass everything. So there are a whole other set of questions about platforms and tags and you know, what is captured on certain platforms, what is deplatformed. Um, but it's just to give you a sense that there's actually tons and tons of work like this out there. So for this project, what I did was conduct kind of long form interviews with a set of about 25 game makers. Um, so a whole range of folks, I tried to capture people with different experiences, different forms of practice. Uh, people like Dietrich Swinkifer, Robert Yang, Jess Marcotte, Nikki Case, Maddie Bryce, Avery Alder, uh, people who work across different kinds of game media. And these <laughs> interviews, you know, it's funny, they were about two hours each. It's a long time to talk to somebody. But the goal was to kind of get beyond the standard things that journalists ask game designers. Um, so often, I, I totally get this, I have this as an academic too, when you get asked questions a lot, you kind of give the same answer as you give the, the like polished answer. And I didn't want the polished answer. I wanted to think more deeply about um, people's practice, the poetics of their work, their own history, to kind of get at the messiness behind queer game design and not just narratives, kind of neoliberal narratives about games are getting better. So from a method standpoint, um, if there are folks here, you know, sometimes there are grad students, for example, who are thinking about how they might design their own work. Uh, so my goals, you know, like I said, I wanted to get past these diversity narratives. I was hoping to produce a piece of work that could be inspiration both for academics, but also for designers. Um, and again, centralizing or centering uh, marginalized voices. So the voices of folks who actually make this work. I talked to people about their personal backgrounds, about their artistic influences and their lineages. Um, so this word avant-garde is in the title of the project. And indeed people talked a ton about um, really not so much their game influences as their other artistic influences. And um, so people drew inspiration from uh, feminist performance art, from Kind of beat poets from, uh, gosh, like 
moments of uh, theater, like Bertolt Brecht and kind of shifting what we think of as theater. So there's a real tie to these earlier moments of avant-garde art making. Uh, we talked about politics and also about intersectional experiences. So trying to hear from folks, especially people of color, designers of color, about how their experiences as queer related to their experiences with race. Here are some of the kind of themes and threads that cross this. So these are things that were shared in common with a lot of the folks that I talked about, that I talked to. So one thing is that a lot of queer games avant-garde work resists the idea of empathy and it questions audience. And there are a lot of times where work by queer folks and trans folks is expected to fit into this narrative of empathy games. Uh, well, the idea of that is that you know, you're making games about people who are marginalized or diverse so that you can hand them to straight players and cis players and they can learn something. They can kind of step into the shoes of the people who are queer or trans. Um, and a lot of this work explicitly pushes back on that. So you have pieces, for example, uh, like Maddie Bryce's Empathy Machine, uh, Anna Anthropy and Merrick Copas have worked like this too, pieces that are explicitly critiquing empathy. So in Empathy Machine, uh, it's an installation that Maddie did, you play her game Manichi, which was very popular back in about 2012. Maddie has gone on to make lots of cool work, but that's the thing that she's known for. Um, and uh, that game is about being a trans woman of color. But instead of just getting to play it, you have to play it on her body. So the controls are mapped to different um, pieces of interface that are strapped onto her body while she's in her underwear. So the idea is that if you want to play this game that people think about as an empathy game, you have to get intimately close to her. You have to be vulnerable along with her. Um, we also have work like ABB's We Know the Devil, uh, which it seems a little bit different on its face. So it's a narrative game. It's about um, trans teens who go to a Christian summer camp who eventually become monsters. But this is what uh, ABB said about this game and her process when we talked. She said, I'm not trying to make games for straight people. At some point I had the revelation that I didn't need to make work that was accessible for as wide an audience as possible. We know the devil is super autobiographical, but it's also about me starting from that autobiographical history and finding alternative avenues out of it. So what's interesting here is both this idea of making games that are not for straight people, that are not for as wide an audience as possible, but also games that draw from personal history. A lot of times queer folks are asked to kind of expose their history, expose their trauma. And um, here AVB is drawing from that, but using fiction to speculate about other ways out of that history. Another thread that we see is this idea that the queer games avant-garde explores and embraces intimacy. And we'll see that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, an example that I really love from this is, uh, this is Jess Marcotte's Rustle Your Leaves to Me Softly on the left. So this is a piece uh, that is an ASMR, I just have to remember the exact way that they describe it. It's an ASMR dating sim, ASMR dating game. So the idea is that you are touching plants, you are dating plants, and in touching plants, you're generating a noise that is about creating a connection with the plants. Uh, on the right, you see Shauna Musgrave's Animal Massage, which is a VR installation um, that has gone both through kind of indie game spaces and art spaces. Um, and it's one that I think really shifts, for me, it was a kind of pivotal point in shifting how I think about VR. Uh, so what happens is that someone puts on the headset, lays down in the gallery space, and you can see there's an audience there watching. Um, and what you see in the headset is this kind of like lovely, peaceful scene with palm trees swaying um, and some cats come up to you, some kittens, and they start like nuzzling your face. But actually what's happening in the real space is that Shauna has mittens on that are mapped to a camera. And so it, it's not kittens that are nuzzling you, it's, it's Shauna, it's, it's the artist with mittens on your face. Uh, so you can see, excuse me, that sense of vulnerability and intimacy with the audience. When I talked to Shauna, this is what she said about it. I wanted to have a personal one-on-one -on -one connection with the person who was having the VR experience. A lot of my games are touchy-feely. And part of that is figuring out how to relate to people. 
When you're queer and trans, your methods of being in relationships are more improvised. I really love that word touchy-feely there. The idea that VR, which we think about, you know, I think, again, in this, in this room, we're probably thinking about VR in very different ways, but the kind of dominant narrative is that VR is about immersion, is about realism, um, and instead VR is a tool for uh, touch and connection with the artist. We also see this thread where the queer games avant-garde draws from personal and especially embodied experiences, but not in the ways that you would expect. So I'll show you what I mean. This is uh, Annie McClure's game, uh, Become a Great Artist in Just 10 Seconds. It's streamed here. So the video I'll show you in a sec, uh, you'll hear someone talking that someone's streaming it and that's Liz Ryerson, who's also a queer games avant-garde art art artist. Um, but you'll see what I mean in a second. This is a very abstract game. So it's not what we would think of when we think about queer and trans folks drawing from their personal experiences. Let me show you a little bit of it. But you know what, let me pull. Yeah, I think there is something up with my connection as far as I'm talking. I was trying to stream it and sign it out there. I don't think the video was there while I was doing that. Um, but it didn't quite work out. Great, so game, what you're seeing is that um, you can take images, you start from works of art often or photography and you're scrambling them. You're kind of creating this highly pixelated, highly abstract art um, based off a system of, of key inputs. Um, so this looks totally not like something you would think of as autobiographical. Let me just do this real quick. For some reason, slides never want to advance after videos. But when I talked to Annie McClure about it, this is what she said. Part of what I'm drawn to um, part of why I'm drawn to abstraction is that it's like an escape from my identity. As a trans person, there's always things about my physical external self that I don't like. Video games or abstract art are a place where you don't have to have a body. To me, there's something that feels really good about floating in those abstractions. So what I, I wanna pull out here is this idea that even this work that seems abstract, that seems opaque, that seems you know, so pixelated, there's not representation in it in a different kind of way represents what the artist wants in relation to their own trans identity, right? floating through those abstractions. We also see the Queer Games Avant-Garde understanding design itself as queer. So I mean that in kind of two ways. I'll show you one and then the other. So on the one hand, we have the process of design as a queer process. Uh, this is Laurie McGee's The Isle is Full of Noises. It's one of what she calls flat games, her flat games. Um, and the process that she uses to make these, I found really interesting. So the art assets here are rendered by uh, her taking markers and paper and drawing a bunch of different things and then using those as the art assets she could use to make the game. So there's a kind of constraint where she told herself, I'm not making additional art. Um, I have to just use what I've created here in order to make this game. Sorry, that one gets a little cut off. Um, so here's what she said about it. She said, the way the game looks is based on serendipity and the chance of what happened before. I love finding ways to bring unpredictability into the creative process. You might say that's a way of querying video game making. It's definitely not a very straight way of approaching things. So you have this chance, you have this messiness, you have a design process that is not necessarily something that is um, planned perfectly ahead of time, that there's a kind of randomness that comes in. I mean, it's something that Andy McClure talks about as well. She talks about uh, collaborating with algorithms and collaborating with glitches as a way to bring some of that chance into her process. So the other thing that I mean when I say that uh, the Queer Games Avant-Garde kind of thinks of design queerly is also that the design that these artists produce uh, 
has queer elements. So it challenges the norms of what game design tends to be, things like uh, rules and goals and how you interact. Um, many of those norms are deeply tied to expectations around gender and sexuality and identity. Um, so when those norms themselves get shifted, we start to see those uh, relationships to gender and sexuality shift as well. Uh, this is a more recent piece. It's by Dietrich Swinkofer. It's called Robot, Robot Slow Dance. Um, you'll see it's a, mostly an analog piece um, that gets played by two people in the same space. So let me show you a quick video of this. Why hello? Are we just going to stay here or what? Nice microprocessor in there. I've been thinking a lot about artificial intelligence lately. What do you say? I can't hear you. I must admit, I don't go to some very often. So, what do you like on stuff? Do you have positive feelings towards in life? I don't know much about having a robot politics, but I find it impressively engaging. Quite loud in here, don't you? I love that piece. Also, I feel like that's what it's like whenever I try and talk to other humans. <laughs> what, what is it? What are some things you care about in life? Um, so you can see, you can see in that piece um, how a lot of the things that we normally think of as basic game design, things like rules and goals are not there. Um, so it starts out with this little shot of the rules, which are kind of like, you know, try and connect if you want to or don't. Um, and it's mostly about showing us what a conversation might look like um, between people who are having trouble connecting, between people who are feeling awkward. Um, and I'll show you what Squinky says about it. Now, let's see, this is why I'm frustrated with you Google Slides. Okay, there we go. They say, Robot Slow Dance is not intended to be a game anyone can win, so much as a silly, playful exploration of the queerness of non-human relationships, very much inspired by my own confusing experiences of trying to date while neurodivergent and trans. So here we have this game that um, you know, is kind of sweet and goofy, but also is directly drawn um, from personal experiences and that translates into its design. So with all that said, there are definitely tensions and differences that come out across these uh, interviews, across these conversations. So one of them is the question of whether there is a queer games community. So when I started talking, you heard me be like, you know, it's not quite a community, it's a network of people. And that's because people have very different feelings about whether they are part of a queer and trans game making community or whether they are not. On the one hand, we have people who said, you know, there are events that are really important to me, things like QGCon or different games, uh, which takes place often on the East Coast of, of the States. Um, where I really feel connected to people. And then there are other folks, people like Liz Ryerson, who said, I, I am not part of a queer games community. My communities lie elsewhere with other kinds of art making. And I actually often felt really ostracized from the communities we think of as queer games. There was a real difference in how people felt about whether queer games should represent queer sex. Uh, so on the one hand, there are queer game makers who feel like representing sex is really important. It's a kind of radical politics to not shy away from queer sex. And then on the other hand, people who felt like representing queer sex was just sensationalizing queerness, kind of giving a straight audience this very sexualized vision of queerness, and that that was what was problematic. So some examples of that, we've got on the one hand work by Robert Yang. Um, Robert is, I think, best known for his work that's quite sexually explicit or sort of the most explicit that we have really in parts of the queer game scene. Um, so this is Rinse and Repeat, which is about men kind of washing other men in, in the shower at the gym. Uh, and Robert was very clear that for him being explicitly sexual is political, is about taking um, the medium of video games which is historically homophobic, still homophobic today, and bringing queer sex into it. But on the other side, there were a lot of people who talked about being inspired by work like Dream Daddy, 
Um, Dream Daddy, I would not think of in the same queer games avant-garde. It's made by a larger studio. It's made primarily by people who are not queer. Um, but people found it inspiring the way that this game doesn't show queer sex. Uh, so it's a dating sim about dads dating other dads. I mean, it has almost no sexual content. So they felt like that actually was a much better representation of queerness. And then this one is kind of where some of my work is headed now, uh, which is thinking about a brighter future for queerness or a kind of queer apocalypse. So some of this work was invested in making things better you know, doing some of that education around helping people understand what queerness is like, promoting inclusivity. And a lot of it is about burning things down. So even when it's happy, even when it's shiny, it's often about thinking about how we may need to destroy the world as we know it in order to create a new and queer world. We see that, for example, in some of Nikki Case's work. So on the one hand, Nikki uh, is often making work that's about educating people. So Nikki is an interesting case. Their work is kind of the outlier in that empathy issue. Um, but they're often making games that try and teach people, you know, what is it like to come out or where does discrimination come from to try and make things better. Whereas on the other hand, we have work like Gender Wrecked, um, which you see here, uh, which is about a kind of post-apocalyptic landscape where everything has been destroyed, where gender is basically the force that has destroyed the universe. Um, and it's in that post-apocalypse that we're able to see people come to their transness um, and come to their gender identities in new ways. So from all of that, I wanna kind of pivot us into this last part, which is new ways of thinking. What is it that these uh, examples of design help us think about differently? One of the biggest kind of takeaways here is this idea that video games don't have to look or play or feel like we typically imagine. They can be so much more than we're used to thinking about games and they can be so much queerer. So they're this space of possibility that we can re-envision. Re this work also reminds us that video games aren't just an art form, right? There's kind of an argument inherent in calling this an avant-garde, which is that video games are an art form and should be thought of within a larger lineage of art. Um, I'm just gonna take for granted that games are art because of course they are, even though that's an ongoing debate. Um, but more than just being an art form, they are an expressly political art form. So we're seeing that even work that is abstract, even work that seems disconnected from cultural politics um, is deeply rooted in the lives of marginalized people. This work questions what it means for something to get better. So if we want things to get better in tech, if we want things to get better in games, if we wanna be more inclusive, that's great, but what does it mean to be better? And so I think this work really prompts us to talk to the people that we want to serve, to talk to queer and trans folks or people of color, or folks with disabilities or any of these things um, to figure out what better might mean for them. And then broadly speaking, queer game design challenges us to reimagine design norms that go beyond games. So let me show you an example, and this is a piece that Kata knows, but an example of how this work on queer game design might translate into uh, fields like HCI and kind of design more broadly. This is a piece that I co-wrote uh, with Joseph Nguyen, who is a, a collaborator of mine who's at UT Dallas, uh, which was a, a Kai piece that came out last year on challenging, um, on the challenges of designing consent. So the idea is that consent is something that comes up across design in many ways, right? When we ask users to consent to certain kinds of interactions, the way that their information is collected. Um, but if we look to video games and especially queer video games, we start to see new ways that we can imagine consent. So for this paper, we looked at a series of queer games. Uh, this is Merrick Copas's Hug Punks and Robert Yang's Hurt Me Plenty to think about how those games structured consent because they are explicitly intimate, they are explicitly sexual and they are designed with consent as part of the experience. So we talked about how we might translate that into designing consent into other kinds of uh, design systems. So that's where I'm going to leave us um, is kind of thinking forward about what else we might want to do with this work. Uh, thanks so much for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts.
Yay, thank you. Um, first, I'm going to stop recording and giving you a minute to breathe.